Okay, this is Ben Doughty with Tip TV. I'm joined by British Boxing's man of the moment currently, Eddie Hearn. Um, that can all change. It can all change. You know, it's, it's a very fickle game, yeah, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, one thing I certainly can't vote is your hospitality here. Good. At enjoy, the, enjoy the grub. Uh, absolutely, good, yeah. Good. Um, and I've always liked to stay at the hotels and prize fighters on. Good, yeah, they're very but, uh, expensive. We spend too much money on them. Uh, yeah, at one point you yeah. tried to stop the alcohol bit. But, yeah, um, well, that's such a thing, so I've seen your bar bills. Yeah, no doubt. Rather frightening. Yes. Um, but in any case, um, inevitably, You've been branded in some quarters, perhaps ra ra rather unfairly, as a Johnny Come Lately mm. who had it all handed to him on a plate mm. because of the legendary sports company set up, mm. obviously, by Father mm. Barry. Uh, it's not really fair to say that, and boxing's actually been a lifelong passion of yours, true? Yeah, I, listen, I've had a great start, but you yeah. know, you played, a, you played a hand that you dealt, and uh, you know, as Eric will tell you, I've been around boxing a long, long time, and it, it, people don't really know that. A lot of people in the business will say, oh, Ed, what does he know? You know yeah, exactly. And people, it doesn't mean that I'm a boxing expert, but I have been around you know, the sport for over 20 years. And, so, and, and I've read about your love for the game and the way you used to, as soon as you finished school, the first thing you wanted to do was get around the gym yeah, and mix with yeah, the fighters true. and be around the ball. Yeah, I respect fighters a lot. You know, I think yeah. it's the toughest and probably the best sport in the world, and they, they give up a lot of sacrifices. Did you ever contemplate, I, mean, I know you've done a bit of training, did you ever contemplate having a go at it in any career sense? I had a couple of fights at Billy Ricky Boxing Club yeah. as an amateur, yeah, yeah. Um, quite average. You've Jimmy Mack, you've got any Mac. footage of yourself? I, I have actually, Jimmy Mack. I'd love to see that. Yeah, Jimmy Mack used to train me, or Jimmy McDonnell, really? and he comes, yeah. he comes to all my fights actually. So there's a bit, um, of, a bit of extra credibility there that you've actually been there at the show. Not if you would have seen it. <laughs> not no, really. No, I'm not well, if you ever yeah, fancy yeah. uploading it to YouTube, no, yeah, then I'm not sure about that. Let I was, me know. I, was, I think I was like 64 kilo. I was like that, yeah. and I was just like, like Jack in the Box. I was awful, but yeah, I wanted to do it, and I think I think ultimately going down there and mixing with normal people because I yeah. went to a private school, yeah. who, which I didn't overly enjoy because I didn't feel as though the company that I was keeping outside of school was anything like the company I was Similar. keeping in school. Um, so I liked being around boxing. I liked being around these these men, yeah. you know, big, strong, tough guys, and a lot of them become my heroes. You know, people that yeah. weren't household names: Francis Ampofo, yeah. Richie Everett, Paul Silky Jones. You know, they were the heroes to me. And um, I you know, saw I a picture of you enough. the other day with Herbie Hyde when you yeah. must have been about. You could have only been about thirteen. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah. Well, again, you know, Herbie Hyde. You know, we used to go for a deep pan pizza after training in Romford yeah. literally every day. Yeah. It, me, Herbie, and Francis. You know. And, you know, you learn a lot. You're not necessarily there to take it in, but you just soak it in like a sponge. Did you imagine that your, meteor your meteoric rise would be, well, as meteoric as it's been? Because it seemed to be something very organic which occurred. My association with Matchroom becoming majorly interested in boxing again after having a few quiet years was the advent of the prize fighter tournament, which has been a hugely successful format. That appeared to coincide, correct me if I'm wrong, more or less with your own hands-on involvement. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, uh, your father had said to you, you, you can do this and run this, but you're doing it. Yeah. It's a, you, you're going to have to take, take the horns. Yeah. Now, next minute, everybody, there's a mass exodus of fighters mm. from Strank Warren stable, and you seem to be signing all and sundry. It seemed to start with um, Kel Brook and Carl Froch and Darren Barker, mm -hmm. and then it was just one after another yeah. star names. What, why did that happen, and did you imagine it would happen as quickly as it I did? I think a lot of it, I think we were missed in boxing. You know, I think we were a credible promoter, and people liked what we, we did in the past. I think we had a good name. And when we came back, people were pleased to see us. A lot of it started with Audley Harrison, you know, yes. rightfully or wrongfully, and meeting him in a casino in, in uh, Vegas like I did when I was running the poker side. You know, I took him and I said, look, let's do something big. And actually, that was the conversation with my old man where he said, you're on your own, because he wasn't all his biggest that, fan. That was the moment the blue touch paper lit Yeah, and I thought, said to him, let's, let's win prize fighter, then we'll win the European title, then we'll fight David Hay. And he, he believed in me and, and we did it. And, you know, it ended back poorly. But from there, Darren Barker was the first. Two weeks later, Kel Brook phoned me up. And two weeks later, so Carl Fox phoned me up. And then, and then it was like, we're the hottest thing in boxing. And, you know, I'm younger than most promoters and it was seen as a breath of fresh air, if yeah. you like, and people believed in what we were doing. And we took a few chances because what we were doing before I got involved was, was toilet. And every other promoter was, was producing shows that were toilet as well. Yeah. And it was in leisure centres, half full with Commonwealth title fights, yeah. with an eight round chief support. And no one took a chance, no one tried to grow the sport. And we were the ones that did. And firstly, with Brook against Hatton. Yeah. Uh, at Sheffield Arena, which done 10,000 yeah. and rated through the roof. And then Sky thought, actually, we've got a product here if it's done right. OK. Um, to what extent, how do you respond to claims of some people that there's almost an unhealthy monopoly type situation occurring because you've been so successful? I think they now. get monopoly wrong, with, mixed up with success. Yeah. I mean, it's not a monopoly in boxing. There's many promoters. Just at the moment, we're doing very well. 
So I don't think you can be criticised for doing well. I mean, do we want total ownership of the sport? Not really, because we don't want every fighter. No. Do you know what I mean? So do we want to be number one? Absolutely. They're talking of silent fighters, there's a kid who keeps pestering me. He's a, um, an Asian flashy flyweight with the kind of style and kind of swagger of a, of a Nassim Hamid type. And he keeps asking me, um, can you see if Eddie's interested in signing me? He was a national, he was a national finalist, mm. you know, in the senior yeah. ABA. So perhaps I could talk to you about that later and tell him yeah, where. Yeah, where, yeah. I where mean, I don't want to blow on trumpet, but we get half a dozen calls a day. I'm sure you do. From people who want to be on and board. it's difficult. And this is another thing with this fight pass thing that we'll announce shortly, working with other promoters yeah. to get some of those fighters that you're talking about. Because I can't box them seven or eight times a year on our TV shows because no. we've got gold medalist Olympians. What we've got to do that for? Mm. But I can put them and work with other promoters to get them out because our stable is growing and growing and growing, right. and we just haven't got the space. I understand that totally. Now listen, uh, let's talk about, um, well, you talk about how successful you've been and, and because of the risks you took and, and the kind of integrity that you've brought to, mm -hmm. to promotion. You might not want to comment exhaustively on this because I'm sure you're more interested in what you're doing and why it's working and why somebody else's operation isn't working. Mm -hmm. But do you have any thoughts on why Frank Warren's catalogue has dramatically shrunk and do you have any opinion on whether he's staring at the end of a very distinguished career? Oh, I think you have to have a huge amount of respect for Warren as a promoter. Yeah. He's a great survivor. You know, he's <clears> listen, he's you know, he's taken <coughs> companies into administration before and come again. And uh, yeah. boxing's a tough business. It's not, you know, we've worked very hard to get the model right. Yeah. Um, and yes, my old man is a chartered account and a lot of that is in me. But I think that's the basis of running a successful business. And um, Again, you know, I'm not really here to criticise anyone. I like the way some people do business. I don't like the way other people do business. But for me, you know, our integrity is key. You know, everybody, all the fighters are happy. All the fighters get paid on time. And you know, we just crack on and do our business. I hope that promoters in the game stay in the game because yeah. him trying to outdo me makes me do even better and probably so vice versa. And you. I would say that other promoters have really picked up their game in the last 12 months as well because they were terrible yeah. Yeah. and now they're improving. Uh, but times change, you know, just because Frank Warren was a great promoter 20 years ago doesn't mean he's a great promoter now and people change and mediums change and my old man changes, probably wouldn't be as good a promoter now as he was then because he doesn't understand the audience, he doesn't understand the market, he doesn't understand the new world of technology. It's a generational well. thing. It is. So. Uh, finishing on a couple of questions about your own love of the sport we've already alluded to, uh, favourite all-time player? Um, do you know what? I'd go. I'd, from a personal opinion, I'd say Michael Brody against Injin Chi. I mean, you know, everyone talks about Wall. Favorite against... all-time fight, yeah. I, I would say Brody against Chi. I was That's there. That's the best I mean, fight you've ever was... seen live. Yeah, 100% oh, the best fight I've seen live was Brody against Injin Chi. Uh, and who, who is your all-time hero in Sugar Ray Leonard. Yeah. And mine too. Yeah. That's a fantastic. I mean, answer. I loved that period. You know, the whole 80s and, and just yeah. And I fights. think Leonard was just. It was a little bit before my time in terms of watching him live. Yeah. But when I was probably 13, 14, 15, I was the biggest boxing anorak you could find. I just read the British Boxing Yearbook every day yeah. throughout the day, and I watched everything. And Leonard was for me the, the greatest. I actually Fearless. met him for Frotch Butte, and I was like, just yeah. totally, you know. And I saw about three or four months ago. I woke up one morning, and there was an email from Twitter saying Sugar Ray Leonard now follows you. Yeah, I was, which like, is I was actually like quite taken back by that. It was I like, was, you know, I was lucky enough to get an interview with him for 15 minutes once, and he was so friendly and. and Giving yeah. you know what I mean, matey. Yeah. It was a bit, it was a bit surreal for me yeah. too. But uh, what about the best fight you've promoted up to now? Um, well, from, I mean, there's. I think from an atmospheric, from a backs against the yeah. wall, I'd, I'd probably say Butte against Froch because that was like, I was so proud of him for taking that fight. He didn't have to take it, but he, he just yeah. he said, oh, you know, I want to take this fight rather than have a tune up for the same money and. And also, obviously, Frotch Groves 2 at Wembley yeah. was, was something that may never ever happen again. No, but, there, you know, I think, I think I think even being involved with Barker against Gill in Atlantic City when he won the world title that day, I mean, you know, that was only 11 months ago. It feels like yeah. three or four years ago, you know. So, yeah. I suppose from achievements-wise, it's, it's Frotch versus Groves 2 at Wembley. Um, but I won't forget Frotch Butte, it was, it was a special night. No, and I remember you you almost got into a bit of trouble for jumping in the ring before it was officially yeah, over, yeah. but yeah, you live and learn in this business. Um, well, I would just point out the referee did wave the fight off. Yeah. And there was cornermen standing on both sides, but you are right. When I found out, he, was, he decided to have an eight count. Yeah. Uh, the bum did go a little bit. I won't know that. No so, uh, In closing, can you give me a quick uh, prognostication, prediction for Kelbrook versus Sean Porter I'm, on August 16th? I'm a big believer that, that Kelbrook's going to knock him out. I think yeah. he's, he looks so well, he's so focused. He's just ready for this opportunity. Porter is a level above anything he's been in with, and Kelbrook's going to have to show that he's got more gears. But I believe he has, 
and you know he's not a Paulie Malignaggi. He's no. someone who's going to hit him with a ramrod jab, jab and right hand when he comes in. Yeah. Someone said to me the other day, which I thought was fascinating, if you could devise a style to beat Sean Porter, it would be Kel Brook. But yeah. if you could devise a style to beat Kel Brook, it would be Sean Porter. And and you know, I just thought, right. yeah, I mean, because you know, interesting. 50-50 yeah, it was. Kind of it is, I believe it's a 50-50 fight. I mean, the odds are. I don't know, like 15 to 8 and 2 to 1. So it's, in a two horse race, that's tight anyway. you know. Yeah. But I just, I just feel like it's Kel's time. I think he's going to do it. Well, I'm wishing you all the luck in the world with Thanks, that. Very, thank you very much for your hospitality today. Cheers, Cheers. mate. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers, boys.